Good morning, everybody. We apologize for a slight technical difficulty this morning that uh, delayed the start of our, our program today, but welcome to Politalk, uh, brought to you by the Greater Wausau Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my name is Michael Loy, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at North Central Healthcare and also the Chair of the Wausau Chamber Board of Directors. Uh, today, we are going to hear from Congressman Tom Tiffany, who represents our 7th Congressional District. Uh, Congressman Tiffany will offer an update from Washington, D.C., and will discuss topics relevant to business and constituents in our district. Uh, this session is designed to be interactive, and we encourage questions from the audience. Uh, you may type your questions in the chat box uh, on the left side of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get as many questions as possible in the time we have allotted. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on the Chamber's YouTube and social media pages following the event. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Tiffany for your update. Welcome, Tom. Hey, Michael. Uh, thanks so much for having me on this morning. And by the way, for all you chamber members, uh, the technical difficulties were on my end, not the chamber. The chamber is doing their job as usual and um, able to connect via phone here. And uh, I guess it highlights that uh, uh, part of what uh, we should all be pushing for is uh, better broadband throughout <laughs> throughout Wisconsin, especially northern and north central Wisconsin. So anyhow, but anyhow, it's it's great to be with you here today. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to take a couple minutes, and then I'd really like to take questions. And um, uh, uh, Michael, I'm assuming you guys will moderate that and share the questions, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. So a few things to start out with. Um, a new session of Congress has started. Um, I just received my committee assignments now this week. Uh, there's two committees that will be on judiciary and natural resources. Really looking forward to both, but especially the natural resources committee, uh, because I've done a lot of work on that in the past. Very important for northern Wisconsin. Forestry, agriculture, uh, mining, just all those issues. And, uh, you know, tourism is very much natural resources related. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to serving on that committee here as we go forward. Of course, um, couldn't go any further without talking about the events of the last month, which uh, uh, the nation and the world's attention has been on the United States Capitol. And uh, uh, just share a brief anecdote. Um, on January 6th, when the electors um, were uh, being announced when those envelopes were being opened for all 50 states plus uh, Washington, D.C. I was there in the room. I was in the on the floor of the House of Representatives, and we had started at 1 o'clock Eastern time. Vice President Pence was there opening those um, envelopes, and we got to Arizona, uh, and there was an um, objection filed by both a House member and a Senate member. And when that happens with the electors, and this has happened previously, uh, 2017, there, were, there was an objection, 2005, there was an objection. So it has happened before. And, um, but when that objection happens, then each House retires to its respective House, and we have two hours of debate. We were an hour into the debate on Arizona when there was a ruckus outside of the House of Representatives and uh, ultimately tear grass was dispensed in the rotunda. And at that point, the staff in the House of Representatives said, we want you locked down here in the house and uh, please don't go out and all that stuff. So um, uh, uh, we continued our debate while in the house, but then uh, it went from a ruckus to people banging on the doors to get in the House of Representatives. At that point, we were evacuated out of the building. I went through tunnels underneath the um, uh, United States Capitol that I've never been on, in before, and they ultimately took us to a secure area. I went back to my office. Uh, uh, one of my staff members is a former Marine who did, I think, two or three tours over the Middle East, knows how to take care of himself. I went back to my office because I could count on him and others in my office. So, uh, you know, really an unfortunate um, series of events that went on there. But we did complete the task later that evening. Um, Capitol was locked down for about five or six hours. And then we went back and completed the process with Vice President Pence opening all the envelopes. And, of course, Joe Biden was named uh, or uh, he had the number of votes over 270 to be the next president of the United States. And of course, 
He was sworn in last week as the 46th president of the United States. So um, uh, really quite an eventful January out in the United States Capitol. I would just say one thing uh, before we go forward here. The, th the thing in retrospect, first of all, I, I do believe there should be a full investigation of what happened because it really did seem like capital security was not ready. And in fact, there were instances where the doors were being opened by capital security and just letting people in. I really think there needs to be a full investigation as far as what happened that day, what went wrong. And uh, so I think that uh, certainly needs to happen. Now, Washington, D.C., I mean, I was out there last Thursday and voted. I mean, it's basically martial law out in Washington, D.C. at this point. And I kind of get the sense that what happened on January 6th, security was not ready for. Uh, the mayor of Washington, D.C. turned down the National Guard the day prior when offered. I, I really feel like they weren't prepared on January 6th. And now um, they're prepared beyond what I think they really have to be after having been out there last week. But nonetheless, uh, things will be moving on from here. So besides the committees, you know, we've seen a lot of activity um, uh, with the new president sworn in. Uh, president Biden has taken a number of executive actions and you're seeing those in the news, everything from the Keystone pipeline, um, uh, pulling the permit in regards to that, uh, uh, allowing people to cross the border if they choose to um, uh, and not being detained. Um, even though I see there was a, a, a stay put on that by a co uh, court in Texas yesterday. So it's just been a whole series of executive orders that have come down now. And uh, I'm sure that those will continue as we go forward. As far as legislation, uh, of course, um, being a Republican, uh, we sit in the minority. And uh, what we're hearing is that there's another stimulus package that's being considered. Uh, I think the majority Democrats in both the House, especially in the House, but as well as the Senate, they're taking a look at what they want to do as far as an additional stimulus package. If uh, there should be another thousand, two thousand dollars extending unemployment, there's a variety of things like that that are being discussed at this point. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes out of that legislation as we go forward. I would just say one thing. Um, so I have voted against uh, uh, when you look back a couple of months ago at the additional stimulus money coming out from Congress. And the reason I've done that is primarily in regards to the debt. It greatly concerns me that we're going to be approaching $30 trillion in debt. I mean, you just can go back like 15 years ago and we were at like $5 trillion, something like that. And uh, it's one of the main reasons I ran for elected office way back years ago um, for town board is to make sure that we we're being fiscally responsible. It really deeply concerns me about the additional debt that's ta being taken on and um, um, so I'll be real skeptical in regards to that. But the bigger thing that concerns me at this point, as far as a new package that's coming out, is the um, extending the enhanced unemployment. If you remember back in March, when uh, the pandemic hit, there were lockdowns being done by both the federal government for a brief time, but then especially the states, the, uh, there was enhanced unemployment of about $600. In other words, over and above what the state was paying, because the state pays nearly $400 a week in unemployment. That's the maximum. So there were people that were making the equivalent of almost $25 an hour with the enhanced unemployment. And um, I understand we're trying to get people through a tough time. I supported that. But now uh, if we do the enhanced unemployment once again, and they're talking about $400 a week on top of what the state offers, it really serves as a disincentive to work. And that's probably one of the things that I'm most concerned about uh, with this next stimulus package that may be coming forward. I'm sure there will be a stimulus package. It's just going to be a matter of what's in there. So anyhow, with that, um, I hope that gives a little bit of an overview. And I'd be happy, Michael, to take any questions that you may have. Great. Thanks, Congressman. I think one of the things that I'd like to start off with is, you know, you're new to Washington, D.C., obviously a mainstay here in the state of Wisconsin with uh, state politics and the legislature and uh, the Senate. And uh, I just want to get a sense and maybe for our listeners about what it's like to set up a congressional district and staff and office and and how does that influence our ability uh, to interact with you and 
how best can we do that going forward? And just talk a little bit about your journey into Washington and setting up your office. I think that's an interesting uh, process for any new congressman. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. And uh, because it is, it is the case, the most important thing we do is constituent service, whether it's somebody not getting their social security check. I mean, the other day I had a question in regards to being able to get a passport that was hung out for a month. You know, there's just a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, I just called a young man this week over in Barron who is going to get an appointment to West Point. There's just a whole bunch of stuff like that that we deal with that is really not in the headlines. And so when um, I won the special election on May 12, I, am, I had a very good idea of who I wanted to hire. And um, the first thing I did was hire my chief of staff out in Washington, D.C., a man who is a Wisconsin native, has very, um, uh, very good ties into Wisconsin. And uh, between he and I, we put together our staff very quickly. And within three weeks, we had our staff up and running out in Washington, D.C. By the way, I inherited Congressman Duffy's office um, because of it being a special election which uh, with Sean having been there nearly 10 years, um, he had gotten to the place where he had a pretty nice office. And uh, so we enjoyed that for five or six months. Now I just dropped down the totem pole with reelection. And uh, so uh, I don't have quite as nice an office as Sean had with the seniority that he had. But anyhow, uh, we got that was my main goal to start out with was get that office set up and let's make sure that we're doing our job. And we were able to do that. And then we also set up an office in Wausau. And uh, uh, of course, you may remember Sean's office was on Grand Avenue. We moved over on Stewart, West Stewart, where we're just um, just west of uh, 2510 and uh, in the U.S. Bank building up on the third floor. And uh, so we moved our location there and we have staff that has been in place. I um, kept some of Sean's people that he had, John Langton, um, Maggie Cronin, and others, and um, as well as I have a couple staff members in other parts of the district. We did close a couple of our um, bricks and mortar offices that were in other parts of the district, and especially with what's been going on in the last year with so many things being done virtually, um, we've really adapted to where we just have one office in the district that's in Wausau, but we do have people up in Hayward um, over in St. Croix County. I do have staff there. And so we were able to get set up. And uh, the other thing that we did, we were able to get a couple things done, Michael, that I thought were really important. There were a couple sectors of agriculture that did not uh, um, here in North Central Wisconsin, one of them being ginseng growers that did not qualify for the coronavirus food assistance program which helped agricultural producers get through that difficult time, we were able to get them qualified. We were really pleased to be able to do that for both the ginseng growers and the mink farmers that are here in North Central Wisconsin. And uh, so we were able to have some sec successes very early on. And then uh, we've identified a whole series of issues that we think are really important for Northern Wisconsin. We talked about broadband earlier. Um, I wanna see freight rail um, improved the Canadian Nationals looking at selling off some of their lines here in northern Wisconsin. Very important for industry. Uh, and especially if we can get some of that truck traffic off from our roads, get it on our rails uh, and get it on the rails, that could be really beneficial. So I'm following that very closely. And then, of course, we have the Port of Superior, the twin ports up there, Superior and Duluth. And I think that's a very critical area because there's a refinery up there. They're looking at building a new natural gas electrical production plant up there. There's a number of things that are happening up in uh, the far northwestern corner of the state in Superior that are very important for, I believe, the future of not just our state in the Midwest, but for the country. That's great. Uh, we'll get to trade in just a minute, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the current um, nature and composition of Congress right now. Uh, you've got a, a, a slim uh, minority, uh, I think a slimming minority in the House, uh, and then a very slim minority uh, for the Republican Party in the Senate. Um, where do you see things setting up and what are you already hearing in terms of the ability to get some compromise done and, and work across the aisle and still uh, get some of the priorities of the Republican Party um, and yours uh, across the finish line here? You know, I think with a few of the events that it just happened um, early this week that um, 
I'm hopeful that it will set up, that there will be some compromise and people will be able to work together here. And one of the things that um, I believe happened yesterday is both Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin, both Democrats, one from Arizona, the other one from Virginia, uh, West Virginia, excuse me, um, they said that they will not vote to end the filibuster. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most important um, protocol that's being that's used in Congress, specifically by the United States Senate, that really forces um, uh, to be able to get legislation that's more broadly supported. And that was the reason the filibuster was put in place. Part of the reason it was put in place, you know, decades ago. And um, if those senators hold to that, then I think you're going to see uh, a moderating influence on what I would call the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. I mean, uh, and this is not passing judgment or anything like that. I mean, obviously, Senator Sanders, uh, through his campaigns and as his work as a United States senator, you know, he is not with the Democrat Party. He he says he is with the Socialist Party. He really wants to move the country in that direction. And I think that's attenuated a little bit that um, that push to go there if they leave the filibuster in place. And I think that's probably one of the most important thing that's happening at this point. And so you've got a 50-50 United States Senate. Uh, the vice president will, um, as usual, if there's any tie votes, uh, the vice president will cast the deciding vote. So uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris is in a very important position at this point if there are 50-50 votes, which could very well happen. Uh, second thing, in regards to the House, uh, uh, Democrats were up about 30 seats. I don't remember the exact number going into this election. That's gone down now to where their majority is down to about 12 seats. So, for example, uh, if there was a swing of six seats, you'd basically see a 50-50 United States House also. So that has um, had some impact already, like on our committee structure. The uh, we get more seats on the committees as Republicans because we have more members now. So that's already affecting how the Congress is going to work also. Great. One of the questions that came in was uh, Twitter and Facebook are powerful platforms uh, that choose to silence only some voices, it seems. Uh, can Section 230 be modified to level the playing field in your eyes? You know, I think there's a lot of talk in regards to that. Um, and, and there's a lot of disagreement whether Section 230 modifying it or how it's modified, if it will really accomplish the task. And I, I think it is interesting on this issue with the uh, giant tech companies, there is really pretty strong bipartisan support to uh, take some actions on in, in the antitrust side. For example, Senator Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota, has talked openly about really reviewing the um, antitrust implications of these tech platforms that are out there. And of course, they're very much in the news at this point as a result of President Trump being deplatformed. You had international leaders like um, the Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, uh, the head of uh, the Mexican government, the president of Mexico, saying that that is way too much power for companies to have. So I think there's some momentum there to um, perhaps um, use the antitrust laws, perhaps even to break them up perhaps to make some changes to Section 230, but I think it's in the very early stages as far as um, uh, what is the best approach to take. I would throw one more thing in there, Michael, in regards to that question, and um, that is the states can have a role also. I've been reading some stuff in the last couple of days where there's a number of states that are looking at if you're going to deplatform people, regardless of who they are, that um, the states um, have the ability to say that um, we are going to exercise penalties if you're going to take away people's First Amendment rights to free speech. So um, I think there's also some action to be had in the states on that front. Great. Thank you. 
One of the questions that came in was relative to increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour. As you've gone through the district, what are you hearing from small businesses and constituents about that issue? Yeah, a lot of talk about uh, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I think that uh, uh, when you talk to small businesses, they will say uh, oftentimes it's not necessary. We're already paying $15 an hour or more. And uh, but it they also talk about how it's a disincentive to hire people, especially people just starting out. I mean, I think about my three daughters, um, who two of them are in their early 20s, one who's in late high school. And, you know, they all started out at seven, eight dollars an hour at their jobs. And um, uh, they were able to move up fairly quickly up the ladder. But when they started out, they were being paid appropriately at seven or eight or ten dollars an hour. And uh, until they had some experience, until they could show what they could do. And I think that's the main thing that employers say is that, you know, let us be able to start people um, at an appropriate wage in order to keep them or we're going to have to pay them more money. And uh, but largely let the marketplace work. I do not support a mandated $15 wage for that reason. I think specifically about the examples with my daughters. They should not have been paid $15 an hour when they first started out. Um, but they are, uh, two of them are up over $15 an hour because they did prove their worth. And that's really how it should work. Final thing I'd say in regards to that, Michael. So I, I do not support the $15 mandate uh, in regards to the minimum wage. Uh, the other thing is you're seeing so many employers that perhaps paid minimum wage or $10 an hour, $12 an hour they are all up in that $15 an hour range, including uh, retail. Um, if you're going to get good employees, you're going to have to pay, as I think most of the people on this call um, understand. And I know you do, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, unnecessary for our business, given where we are. Um, and we're above that as much uh, as you pointed out. But uh, certainly, I'm sure, interesting uh, dinner table conversations with your daughters over the years on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the ne next question I have is really around infrastructure. We were on a call last week with the U.S. Chamber uh, and one of uh, their staff members there. And he was talking about the priorities of the new administration. And we talked about how each party when they come into power has probably the political capital to get one big thing done. Uh, there's a lot of talk about healthcare, but there's also a lot of talk about infrastructure. Now you talked earlier about uh, being very hawkish on the uh, debt that the country has, but there's also a great need for infrastructure across this country, including fit in there would be broadband. Can you just comment, you know, what you're hearing around infrastructure, broadband, and just generally uh, what's going to be the major legislative package you're going to have to wrestle with here? Uh, yeah, so I haven't heard a lot of details in regards to infrastructure package, package, but it's been talked about for a few years. During the Trump administration, there was frequent talk, hey, we're going to get something done. It did not happen. Um, certainly, President Biden is talking about that now. Hey, we got to do an infrastructure package. I think it's always a matter of the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know one proposal that I saw is let's raise the gas tax 25 cents a gallon at the federal level, and we're going to do all this infrastructure stuff. Um, that's a hefty increase, and especially for those of us in north central Wisconsin, oftentimes who are driving significant distances, um, 25 cents a gallon is a lot of money. Um, I would go back to my legislative days when the first thing that I always wanted to do in regards to any issue, including something like infrastructure, let's make sure we're using the existing dollars we have appropriately. And let's make sure we're getting some of the regulatory burdens out of the way. And that'll be a big focus of mine is that, um, for example, we've seen infrastructure projects. It takes 15 to 20 years to get their permits. That is very costly. And I think that's one of the areas that we could do much better. In fact, um, uh, I don't remember the name of the regulation right now. It escapes me right now. But um, uh, the Trump administration in the final year had made significant changes to that in order to speed up this process. In other words, um, they were setting a maximum time of two years to review this type of project by the agencies. I think that type of stuff is very important because that's where a lot of cost 
gets sunk into these projects. For example, when I was in the state legislature, it was commonly known that if a project had federal money in it, it was almost guaranteed to cost a minimum of 25% more. So I think the federal government can do a much better job of streamlining these processes. And that's one way in which we can free up a lot of money. Now, in terms of uh, putting more money into infrastructure, I'm open to the ideas that are out there. I'm not real hep on 25 cents a gallon increase in the gas tax, as uh, we mentioned. But um, if we can find some other ways to generate revenues, I think that would be a good thing. Um, and the final thing I would say, you know, the broadband thing is such a big issue and that's a key infrastructure issue, I think, as we go forward. I think it's the greatest economic opportunity that we have in northern Wisconsin. And I've been surprised at the number of different pots of money that contain broadband funding at the federal level in different agencies. And it's one of my goals is to find as much of that as possible to benefit us here in northern Wisconsin, because it really is our economic opportunity. As you see people fleeing the cities after the riots of last year, as people uh, want to get to rural parts of America, and I think Wisconsin is a great place to live and work in, and we're going to see more people that are going to recognize that. I think that broadband piece is one of the greatest opportunities we have to attract talent and businesses to Wisconsin, especially to North Central Wisconsin. Those are really interesting insights about infrastructure. I uh, hadn't heard that before in terms of the regulation and the timeline that that extends. That's uh, That would be good work to be done for sure. So that was very interesting. Thank you. So foreign policy is uh, maybe a, a more expansive issue now for you uh, as you're in Congress. Um, and there's uh, obviously a lot of talk about our relationship with China, you know, manufacturing's um, uh, relationship with China. Um, but then specifically for us in central Wisconsin, uh, the impact on the trade with China relative to ginseng. Um, and there's been some movement on our relationship with Taiwan uh, and the importance of that in balancing and countering China. Can you just talk a little bit about that um, Asian uh, interaction in terms of trade and, and just foreign policy and what you'd like to see be done and how it could impact our major industry of ginseng? Yeah, it, it was one of the biggest changes um, going from the state legislature to Congress is the foreign policy piece because really it is the most important thing that we deal with at the federal level. I would say that as far as the presidency, it is the most important thing that a president deals with. And I thought there were, there were two areas in terms of policy. Well, uh, let's just put it under the foreign policy heading that I thought President Trump had great success uh, and where he really changed the Republican Party. One was, and it was both connected to foreign policy. One was in regards to what he referred to as the forever wars especially the long time conflicts that we've had in the Middle East and Afghanistan. I mean, think about that. That goes back to the very first year that uh, the second George Bush was in office. I mean, that's getting to be 20 years ago. And we still have troops in the Middle East and Afghanistan. And uh, that's one place where President Trump really um, changed the Republican Party, where he said, we got to stop doing this. And so when you look at the Middle East and Afghanistan, our troop levels are down to the lowest they've been in a long time. And also you're seeing peace treaties signed by Israel. When you look at the latter half of 2020, wasn't reported on much, but four different Arabic countries signed peace treaties with Israel, which I thought was one of the greatest successes of the Trump administration is keeping us out of war and getting peace in uh, a more peaceable area in the Middle East. There is no doubt to your question though, Michael, our greatest challenge in the 21st century is in regards to foreign policy with China. And once again, that's a place where President Trump really took a much different approach than his predecessors, Republican or Democrat, where he said, we're not going to continue to give away the crown jewels to China. We can't give away all of our manufacturing. I'll give you a quick example of how that plays out too. In talking to local healthcare providers, one of the things that I heard from a vice president of a local healthcare provider is he said that we really hope that you guys bring some of the supply chain 
for um, uh, uh, for medical equipment and medical supplies back to the United States. So we're not too dependent on Southeast Asia. I believe in trade. I believe it's important to trade. And uh, but I think it's also important that we do produce some of these critical items like our um, medical equipment and medical supplies here in America or with trusted trading partners like Canada and others. Um, it has been a real challenge for the ginseng growers. Um, China targeted them to um, shut off trade with them and it really has created significant problems for them. It's part of the reason that I went to bat on the um, coronavirus food assistance program to get the ginseng growers qualified because I'm hoping it makes it it, it it creates that bridge for the next year for them to be able to get through some tough times and hopefully those trade relationships will open up once again. And uh, of course, Taiwan has been one of our good trading partners. I was there, Michael, two and a half years ago. I did a week long trip at the invitation of the Taiwanese government. And it was very interesting going over there. They're a very uh, good trading partner. They're a very open country, one of the freest countries in Southeast Asia. And I do have deep concerns with what China is doing with the saber rattling that they're doing at this point, because um, China has now basically taken over Hong Kong. Hong Kong is no longer truly a free city like it was uh, two decades ago when Britain turned it over back over to China. And I have deep concerns that China has always believed in a one China policy. That means Taiwan will be absorbed at some point by China. I'm very fearful that they may be making those moves now, believing that perhaps the Biden administration will not push back as hard as the Trump administration did. And just a final note in regards to that, I did introduce a bill that uh, rescinds the one China policy that Jimmy Carter put in place back in the late 1970s. I believe Taiwan is a, um, a, a free country in the world of nations here on the planet Earth, and they should be recognized as such, including by mainland China. So I got a couple more questions for you here today. One is I'm gonna circle back to any potential stimulus bill that may be coming uh, through, through Congress here that's being discussed. Being in the minority party, are there a couple key priorities that, you know, if you're gonna pass it or be behind it, you really gotta see as part of it? Uh, I think the key uh, part uh, goes back to uh, a point I made a few minutes ago, Michael, and that was in regards to the enhanced unemployment. The enhanced unemployment is a significant incentive to not go back to work. So think about it. The state pays almost $400 a week in that's the maximum unemployment that you can get. They're talking about, the Biden administration is currently talking about an additional $400 on top of that almost $400. And so you're getting to a place where people the, are better off staying at home. They're going to make more money staying at home than working. And that is the choice that people will make. Um, people will go where the incentives lie. So that's probably, if I had to list one concern that I have of the next stimulus bill is I hope that we do not do that enhanced unemployment because it'll be an ins a disincentive to go back to work. And it's going to hold back our economy for most of 2021 because the biggest challenge every employer has these days is getting qualified help and people in the door to do the work. Great. Next question I have is on immigration. Uh, it looks like the Biden administration is going to try to move quickly on making some changes there. Do you think there's any path to compromise on immigration? And, and what, from your perspective, uh, would that include or look like? Yeah, uh, I, I hope so. Uh, but we've all been saying that for a lot of years. It's really unfortunate that that's just been a political football over the years and uh, because it really should be resolved. I was down to the border. That was the first trip I took in early June after I was sworn in. And uh, it, was a it, it was a very interesting trip. If anybody ever has an opportunity to do that, it's fascinating. And I specifically wanted to go down and see the wall being built. I was down in Southern Arizona. 
And uh, the thing that I was hearing from both uh, federal officials like the Border Patrol, as well as county sheriffs in Arizona, they were saying the wall does work. It does help keep people out. Now we need additional, additional assets like drones and things like that to make sure that we have a full complement of um, things to be able to keep control of the border. But they said it really does work. And we went from uh, four years ago at this time, we were at about 10,000 people a month coming across the border who were coming in illegally. And that dropped to a thousand a month in 2020. So what President Trump had done uh, was very successful in terms of reducing the number of people coming across the border. So my hope is that uh, perhaps we could get an agreement that uh, as far as priorities, we do have to have a secure border. We have to know who's going in and out because it isn't just that people come in illegally. It's all the drugs that are coming in. The, the fentanyl and methamphetamine that is coming across our border is incredible. The human trafficking is incredible. Set aside the illegal immigration that's coming in and out. Just those two things alone are a major reason why we need to control our borders because the fentanyl and meth is doing incredible harm to all of us across America, including North Central Wisconsin. And the human trafficking is rampant. In fact, we saw some stories, I think, earlier this week about it. And uh, it's just a, a terrible story. It's for a variety of reasons why we do need to secure the border, and I do support that. But I think uh, hopefully we could come to an agreement. I don't know exactly what that would look like in terms of um, who we would allow to stay in our country that is already here, um, because it's really not fair to people if they come here legally and somebody else is able to jump the line for somebody that is standing in line um, trying to uh, trying to get into our country. The other thing that I would say is that there's a lot of bad actors that come in uh, when we see these caravans come across uh, from Mexico and the Central American countries. Uh, there needs to be a much better job. There needs to be a full vetting to make sure that we are not allowing people who have criminal histories, especially violent crime histories, into our country. So to wrap up today, I just want to... Uh stop and, and give you kind of a broader question uh, for you to touch on some things that are important to you and priorities. You know, the 7th Congressional District is enormous. Uh, there's a lot of ground that you have to cover, a lot of different constituencies. You know, what are you hearing and, and really what are going to be your priorities in this term uh, that maybe we haven't touched on already? You know, certainly the last two months since the November 3rd election, the election is simply dominated, mm -hmm. uh, really much dominated the story. And I, I just want to make one point in regards to that. Um, so there was a lot of tension around the January 6th vote to object, and I did object to a couple states' electors, and uh, including Wisconsin. The reason that I did that is that not to overturn the election, but I always saw it from the beginning after the November 3rd election through that whole process is to make sure that only the legal votes were counted because we saw in uh, many states and Wisconsin was not the worst, I would say Pennsylvania was the worst, where the absentee voting laws were really set aside in 2020 and they were not followed in many instances. For example, in Wisconsin, many people voted, far more people voted uh, indefinitely confined in this election. And um, th that allows people not to have to provide a photo ID. I think a photo ID is a very important thing. And that was done just in a administrative way by the Dane County clerk. And I believe that's actually illegal under the law. And I think one of the important things that we need to do, and this needs to be done by state legislatures, they need to reaffirm their laws in regards to especially absentee voting to make sure that there's no questions in regards to our elections. And uh, so I'm hoping that's something our state legislatures take up. So setting that aside, um, there's a lot of important things to deal with here. And uh, so we're going to have a stimulus bill that comes forward. We may have a infrastructure bill. But as far as north central Wisconsin, I think the broadband issue is so important. It is our economic development opportunity, and it'll be a focus of mine. Uh, I mentioned freight rail earlier. We have had um, a, a few of our rail lines, including like the 
the uh, rail corridor across Highway 8 from Rhinelander over to Pembine that has been shut down over the last 10 to 15 years. As CN divests themselves of some of these rail lines, I want to see a short line operator that comes in that is much better about both service and rates. And that will affect Wausau also if it is done correctly. And uh, so that's another thing that's very important. I mentioned the port of um, uh, Superior and Duluth. Very important um, for uh, trade with Canada as well as uh, uh, Enbridge has that major pipeline going through there. Hopefully that refinery up there is going to be rebuilt. There's another uh, electrical generation plant that is being looked at, a natural gas generation plant that uh, hopefully is going to be built in the next five or six years. There's some things like that that are really important as we go forward. But uh, I think especially the broadband piece, uh, the freight rail piece are really important here as we go forward. Great. Well, it looks like that wraps up our, our time for uh, this Apollo talk with you uh, this morning. Congressman Tiffany, thank you uh, for your time, uh, the generosity that you've given us uh, with that this morning. And I also want to thank our audience for joining us this morning. Uh, your questions have been great, and we really appreciate your time and interest in hearing from our congressmen. So thank you, Congressman Tiffany, and thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you very much for having me on today, Michael. Thank you.